All right, so um, like I said, I'm starting on the side with your name and the title on it. We're going to run through this as best we can in one class period, um, and I'm sure we'll finish. You guys are um, really consistent on this. So, whew. All right, so let's talk about the levels of ecology. Are we focused? Are we sure? Okay. So um, let's go ahead and talk about an organism or sometimes called an individual. Um, an organism or an individual is basically a single living thing. We like to study these because, well, it tells us a lot about the cellular biology and how they acquire things that they need. Um, this is pretty important to us. When it comes to the next level, which we'll just go ahead and draw an arrow here, um, we have a population. You, if you're going to do it, you got to do it. Okay, whatever. Um, so a population, this is the number of individuals in an area. And it's a particular area, right? It literally tells us, um, you know, in this given space, there are this many copies of this organism. There are this many types of the species here, not types of species, number of species. Um, and then once we have a population, this leads to what we call a community. Community is an interaction of different populations. This is a big deal because this defines a lot of the relationships between different organisms and knowing those relationships helps influence what causes maybe populations to change or helps define what the ecosystems are, which leads us to ecosystem. Um, an ecosystem is all of the abiotic and biotic factors. Okay, so abiotic is anything that's not alive. Temperature, light, soil quality, all of those are not living things, but they really affect the lives of things, right? So um, we need to study both of those, and it's basically like a giant community plus those factors. So that's a big deal. Um, and even those biotic factors are the relationships between living things. We call those interspecies and intraspecies um, factors. Um, could you grab that for me? Thank you so much. Um, so after an ecosystem, we have a biome. A biome is basically going to be a larger ecosystem um, plus climate. Now, I, I say larger. Some biomes are incredibly small, like a pond. But um, still, the climate would have an overall effect on the weather patterns. Climate is defined by basically temperature and precipitation. So is there a lot of rainfall? Is it really dry? Does it snow? Not to mention the temperature ranges that we'd expect within a year. And generally speaking, climate is about a yearly pattern because of the pattern of the sun and the path of Earth around it. Um, then we have the biosphere. No secrets here. This should be pretty easy. This one's just Earth, the entire planet. If we were talking about other planets, well, then that planet would be its own separate biosphere. Unfortunately, we don't know about any of those things that have their own life. Um, let me talk about symbiosis. Symbiosis um, shows um, closely interacting organisms. Um, these closely interacting organisms really come in uh, a few varieties here. We have something called mutualism, which is basically defined by two species having a beneficial interaction on both sides. So one species gets a benefit, the other species gets a benefit. Please keep that in mind. Both benefit when it's mutual. Commensalism, one gets a benefit, the other one really doesn't see an effect at all. So like the, um, the egrets that hang out with the cattle you know, the white birds that hang out with cows outside. Well, the cows are just eating grass and they kind of dislodge some soil. Um, cow doesn't care about the bird being there. It's just no effect. But the, the bird loves it because when the cow rips up the soil, they're up turning, you know, some grubs or some bugs or some worms. And then the bird has a buffet. So bird loves it. Cow don't care. So that's commensalism. Uh, and then we have parasitism. Parasitism are parasites that feed on one thing. Um, so a parasite will basically live 
uh, and feed off of one organism, um, and the other one will receive a negative impact. Um, of course, if you have a parasite living inside of you, your health levels are definitely going to not be where they should be. Um, this really isn't a part of symbiosis, but I'm going to go ahead and add this in there. It's predators and prey. Now, once, of, uh, once again, this shows a positive and negative interaction. One organism gets food. The other one is the food. So that's a pretty big downside for them. Do you guys have any questions on the different kinds of relationships there? These are really extensions of communities. Yes, ma'am. On the medicalism, it's um, positive and a less? It's a zero. So one doesn't get a positive or a negative. It's just like a neutral, I guess. Any other questions? You sure? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and hit up those uh, things on the bottom of this box. We have herbivores. Herbivores eat only what? Yeah, they only eat plants. That's easy. Then we have the next one, carnivores. They eat only? Yeah. Only animals. And we don't want to define it as meat exactly because... Um, an organism may not be eating something uh, only that's meat. They might be eating other things as well. Um, then we have omnivores. Um, I can't spell at all. Omnivores, which are what? Eat, eat both or eat plants and animals. Um, of course, it's not as simplistic as this. Of course, this means they also eat fungi. They eat protists. They can eat bacteria, I guess, to a degree, even though there's not much there. Um, but omnivores basically eat anything they want. Um, and then we have uh, the other one that's labeled up here is a decomposer. But I'm also going to add this in there, a detritivore. Say that one more time. Plats and animals. There's kind of an in there. But anyway, um, decomposers and detritivores, they are two separate things, but we're going to go ahead and define them as this. They break down organic matter. Um, this is a big deal. Um, we want to make sure sometimes uh, nutrients and things get back into the soil. So like fungi or bacteria, they can do this role pretty well. There are plenty of other bugs that do this as well, um, but we usually refer to those as detritivores. Um, there's one that's kind of secretly not on here, but I'm just going to write it down anyway. Scavengers, right? Um, scavengers basically eat carrion, which is going to be the remains of once living things. Let me write this in English now. They eat the remains of once living things. So if a carnivore or an omnivore eats an animal but leaves something behind, well, then a scavenger is going to swoop in there and eat that up. Um, they're basically a variation of a carnivore. Okay. Um, I should also go ahead and mention that fun word down here at the bottom. Niche. A niche is a role within uh, a habitat. Okay, now that role within a habitat is really vital. Um, if you guys have watched movies or watched a play, you don't have different actors playing the same role at the same time. That would get really confusing for the viewer, and it would not convey the story. Well, in an ecosystem, if you have two organisms that are playing the same role in the same location, you're going to have, like, it's not going to be good for either one of them. So they'll have to, one will have to outcompete the other, which in turn means one will die off. Um, so a niche is really important. A role is really important. Even where in the habitat they live plays a role. Are they at the top of a tree or are they at the bottom of a tree? There are different types of squirrels, ground squirrels and tree squirrels. There are different kinds of lizards and nulls that live up in a branch or down on the ground. They still can coexist because they don't go in the same locations in the habitat. Um, you probably have heard, heard of things like an apex predator. That's a good example of a niche. It's, yeah, it's the big big guy on campus, right? It's the one that is the top dog. It will eat and it will win. There's nothing else that eats it. Um, you might have heard of these things called keystone species. You guys remember those? They have a major effect on an ecosystem. Sometimes we have um, other things, what are they called, facilitators? 
Um, facilitators basically like build up a, a, a dam, like a beaver. They'll build a dam and a lot of things will live off of that. Maybe like a gopher tortoise will dig a hole and rattlesnakes live in there. That helps other things live. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of different roles that uh, other things can serve. Um, we even talked about trophic cascade. Like we said how um, if you affect a keystone species, it's going to affect a whole lot of others too. Um, anyway, all of these are niches, um, different roles that they serve. Doing okay? Any questions? Yeah. So can carnivores bounce between, like, the, being found here as a carnivore, like hyenas, like they kind of only off Yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's a particular role, and in the cases of a hyena, um, they're adapted to be able to go, like, hey, we can scavenge when we need to, and we'll hunt when we need to. It depends on the situation. So uh, a lot of the times it is a little hard to paint them into a box. Um, because they do fill multiple roles sometimes. Anyway, moving on. Yeah? Okay, let's talk about those producers. Um, producers have a more technical name. They are technically more so called autotrophs. Please write that down. Autotrophs mean they make their own food. Uh, and their ability to make their own food determines, bless you, um, uh, basically how much energy from the sun becomes part of the ecosystem. There are other autotrophs called chemo-autotrophs, or they use chemosynthesis. Of course, they don't use sunlight. They use chemicals to help them do that. Um, then we have consumers. Um, consumers basically work on a few levels. We have primary, which uh, eat the producers. We have secondary, which eat the primary no surprise here tertiary eat the secondary and quaternary if it's there eat the tertiary that's the basic concept so if you guys remember we talked about these energy pyramids remember those mm -hmm. your but your base level producers are down there on the bottom. They're found in the highest numbers in most cases, or at least they have the most biomass in most cases. Um, think about campus here. There are organisms that live on campus, not humans. We don't live here. We just like stay here and we mostly live off of Walmart and Publix, you know what I mean? But um, we don't live off this land, but organisms do. Grass and trees, there's probably more plants on this campus than there are squirrels, bugs, and you know hawks combined, right? Yeah, there's grass everywhere. There's trees everywhere. Um, so there, we're going to see a lot more for the producers. Um, how much energy is transferred to the next level? 10%. Only about 10%. Um, it's an about. It's not perfect, but it's rough. Um, that goes to the primary consumers. And then only about 10% moves on to the secondary consumers. And then about 10% moves on to the tertiary. If there is a quaternary, it's very tiny. Uh, and there you go. Hey, just to let you know, there's a hawk that lives behind the band room. Yeah, by the practice softball field. There's a hawk that lives up there. He might be the only one on campus. But I think maybe the number of squirrels he might find in the local area might be enough to keep him around. You know what I mean? So he might only be one, maybe two. Um, that's it. But when it comes to plants, lots. When it comes to squirrels, lots not as many as plants but lots you know what i mean so we can kind of see that hierarchy that exists there um food chains food webs those are pretty easy right um nothing really to say for a food chain i even drew an example on your paper the only thing i want to point out to you is that it's linear it's a line it's a chain it's a sequence um this is eaten by this is eaten by this is eaten by this and it's very straightforward right yeah um and then we have a food web this is much more complex, and I just want to say it's multiple food chains in an area. These are crazy complicated in some cases, but if you understand each individual food chain, you can kind of lay them on top of each other and see how many interactions take place at the same time. A lot of the cases, it means your, your normal terms for primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary consumers, they might change what role they have. Maybe your primary consumer, uh, yeah, your primary consumer in one case is probably maybe a tertiary consumer in another case, um, even within the same system. So once again, their niche is pretty unique. Um, 
I also want to mention Succession. Um, there's two versions. There's Primary. This is the first Living Things in an area. So if you have a new piece of land that's being created, now of course that doesn't happen as often today, but let's say we got a volcanic island and it spews forth some lava, it cools down, and that's brand new land. Well, it's going to take a long time, thousands of years, for the first living things to show up there. They might grow on the rock and then they might die. Once they die, they might become detritus, which can basically become soil, um, and then later other things can show up. Secondary succession... Um, by the way, pioneer species are the things that show up, or frontier species are the things that show up in primary succession. Secondary um, succession is basically when old living things are replaced with new. Um, so let's say there's a forest fire. Well, most of the biomass has been destroyed, but there's still some left behind. Maybe there's some roots. Maybe there's some seeds or acorns or something, and those can spring up and basically cause a second takeover. Um, it doesn't really mean second. It could mean like the 500th time this has occurred, but you get the concept. It just means secondary to primary. It comes later. Doing okay? Any questions? Are you sure? Okay, let's get to the fun stuff. Human impact in ecosystems, because we all love what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Lucky for us, I wrote almost all of this down, so I'm not really going to write much, but we do have the good and we have the bad. There's a whole lot more bad than there is good, but I tried to get as much good on there as, as I could to make us feel all right about ourselves. Um, we conserve energy, and we also use renewable energy, so it's nice to not spend energy on things we don't have to and then when we do it's good to have a source other than fossil fuels that would be key using wind power electric power uh, hydroelectric power um, and the like we have um, control over pop, uh, pollution to a degree um, it's not perfect it's not over encompassing um, but hey we're at least putting in some regulations that affect companies abilities to do that education that's so high up on the list because it's so important we teach people about what we do to ecosystems so we know what we could be doing. An informed population is probably a safer population. Um, nature preservation. We have national parks and state parks, and we tell animals, like, hey, go live there, and we won't bother you, and that's nice. Conservation areas are also important. We have, um, it says reclamation. So basically, we reclaim territory that we've kind of done stuff to or messed up, and we're like, hey, Let's let this get better. Let's do something to restore it back to its normal state. Uh, and then, of course, there's recycling, which uh, is good. Why, why use materials all the time when we can just like reuse those materials? That would be good. Um, when it comes to bad stuff, um, well, there's a lot. There's extinction events that we've created. We've killed off species because of our own activities. Things like um, over-exploitation, like overfishing, overhunting. Um, my goodness, like we've done a lot of crazy stuff like that. Uh, pollution, of course, we've still released a lot into the uh, atmosphere and into the oceans and the ground. Um, we've also have a growing population, which basically means it leads to us causing um, habitat destruction or habitat loss. Um, we deforest areas. We literally rip up trees or cut them down. This can lead to desertification. Um, this can lead to, you know, basically dry patches within forest and they don't recover. Um, and we overall have been um, leading to something called global climate change, and that's the release of a lot of carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere, well, which uh, is, a, is a greenhouse gas which re retains temperature around the planet. So, doing okay? Do we have a good understanding of the good and the bad we do? Yeah, okay, cool. So let's talk about some of those cycles. Some of these cycles include the water cycle. I hope I don't need to like walk you through the entire thing, but can I just remind you of something important? Precipitation leads to runoff. Runoff's really important, not just within the water cycle, which it is. Of course, it breaks things off, wears down and erodes rock, um, but also it leads to other things being introduced into the soil. Um, this actually affects directly something like the phosphorus cycle or even the nitrogen cycle. 
Um, the other thing about the nitrogen cycle that I want to point out to you, once again, basically, we know rock is broken down, nitrogen can be released. Um, we know nitrogen is the most common gas in the atmosphere, but plants need nitrogen from the soil. So how does the nitrogen get from the atmosphere to the soil? Nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, these are just bacteria, in some cases fungi, that basically take in a little nitrogen and they basically, when they die, they die within the soil and they leave behind deposits of nitrogen. So the plants can use them. Even the potted plant right there, peat the plant, um, that potting soil they use already comes with nitrogen in there. But later, like if I just keep that soil going for a really long period of time, there's not enough nitrogen in there for them to grow a whole lot, even if I give them sun and water and all the good stuff. So in a lot of cases, you got to add something like miracle Grow or something that has nitrogen or fertilizer, which has nitrogen and bacteria within it that help continue to bring nitrogen inside. You guys doing okay? Okay, last thing I want to point out about the carbon cycle. As you guys know, carbon dioxide is released through cell respiration. It's taken in by plants through photosynthesis. If the plants die, and even as the organisms die, any organic-based life, when it dies, it basically gets trapped inside of the ground, and those deposits are basically either coal or oil or natural gas. And then later, what we've done is we've extracted that, and we basically have created an increase in CO2 levels. Once again, it acts as a uh, greenhouse gas. Um, so in the atmosphere, we see an increase in the greenhouse effect. So temperature is retained in the atmosphere, which is bad. Um, but also in the oceans. You guys remember what that leads to? CO2 in the oceans? Yeah. Actually, ocean acidification, which leads to something like coral bleaching. This is a big deal. This is killing off a lot of sources of biodiversity. And the lower the bi biodiversity we have, the less likely an ecosystem is to bounce back from bad things that happen to it. Doing OK? Questions on the cycles? So when it comes to those biomes, um, aquatic, that means water. Hey, the main difference between freshwater and marine systems is what? Salt, yeah. Um, so the salt concentration. So uh, if it's basically greater than 1%, oh, sorry. If it's less than 1%, it's freshwater. If it's marine... It's greater than 1%. Um, there's other factors that influence marine systems too. Hey, the ocean, it's crazy deep, which means light can't reach all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So it's actually dark for a majority of the depth of the ocean, which means they got to get energy in some other way. Either they live up top and they come down for a while, or they go down really deep and they get energy from another source, namely chemosynthesis. Um, when it comes to terrestrial systems or land systems, there's a few varieties. We have forests. Wow, I can't spell. Forests come in three flavors. We have a tropical forest, which you know as a rain forest. We have a temperate forest, which you know is like a deciduous forest or basically where we live. Um, and then of course we have these fun ones called boreal forests. Um, all of these receive a fair amount of water. Tropical forests get the most. Um, because they're tropical. They're found around in, in the equator. Um, so we're going to see a lot of water dropped here. Temperate forests get enough. Remember, if there's big trees, you need big water. Just straight up. you got to have water for trees. Um, the main difference between these is their climate. So what kind of temperature range do they operate in? Tropical is warmer. Temperate is in between. And boreal is generally colder. Um, we also have these cool things called grasslands. Grasslands can come in three flavors too, tropical, temperate, and of course, steppes. Steppes are pretty dry and pretty rocky. 
Temperate, of course, is still dryish, but uh, they have like cold and hot seasons. And then tropical, um, it's still fairly dry because it's only grass, it's no trees, uh, but they get these monsoon seasons and they're really affected by fires. Um, then we have deserts. Um, deserts are basically very dry. That's the big thing. They can be hot and they usually are, but they can also be extremely cold like the Arctic. Uh, and then we have tundra which has very little precipitation, but extremely cold. Oh my gosh, I cannot spell. Yeah, and you said the right word there, permafrost. Because the ground is permanently frozen, which makes it really hard for things to live in there. Um, so those are the four main categories that we have there. Um, I should also point out, you can be cold because you're really high in elevation, or because you're really you know, far north or really far south. It depends. Can I move on to the other side of the paper? Okay. The brain. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I, I tried. Uh, yeah. The front portion of your brain is called the frontal lobe. The top portion is called the parietal lobe. The back portion is called the occipital. Yeah. Uh, and then the bottom portion is called the temporal lobe. Um, do you really have to know the functions? I don't think you do for the EOC, but just in case, we're going to say most of your higher level thinking takes place on the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe is mostly um, senses. And we'll say motor functions. Occipital is vision. Temporal is memory. Um, as well as some hearing and stuff like that. Cerebellum. Yes. So this back portion is called the cerebellum. That's used mostly for balance. We have three portions within this uh, brain stem that we care about. This is called the midbrain. We've got this back portion called the pons. And this portion right here, it's called the medulla. Um, this whole thing up here, that's called the cerebrum. And just the outer layer, the outermost layer, that's called the cerebral cortex. Fun stuff. Um, I also wrote on there, um, maybe unnecessarily, but there's the CNS, which is the central nervous system. So that's brain plus spinal cord. Um, and then there's the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. Um, this is going to be all other nerves. Um, there you go. Any questions? It's your brain and spinal cord. Any added questions? I'm waiting. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and talk about the, uh, let's do blood. Blood. So blood is comprised of a few main components. There is, of course, red blood cells, which basically their job is to carry oxygen and CO2. There are white blood cells. Their job is to fight pathogens. More on that later. We have plasma. Plasma is water and something called sodium, which basically is a component of salt. Um, and basically we're saying the salty solution in your blood um, is the liquid part of your blood and also um, keeps things kind of balanced osmotically. Um, platelets. Um, these stop bleeding. If you are a hemophiliac, or if you've heard of a hemophiliac, they have a problem with bleeding. Well, that's because they have a lack of platelets, more than likely. H2O plus Na, which is sodium. Um, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's actually a component of red blood cells. It's what allows 
oxygen to attach. This is important because, of course, oxygen is uh, very, very, very uh, important for gas exchange and all the cool stuff we do. But hemoglobin basically has an iron component, which causes oxidation, which means oxygen can bond to it. Um, and um, good stuff is uh, it gives the uh, red-colored blood. So unless you're a crab, you have red-colored blood always, forever. Um, yeah, those aren't – that's not blue blood. Sorry, man. Uh, your heart. It's got four chambers. Um, heart really doesn't look like this, but I'm trying. Um, this is the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. Now, how blood flows in these four chambers is like this. We start off with the body, where the body transports deoxygenated blood back to the heart. This goes up through a thing called the vena cava and goes to the right atrium. Um, from the right atrium, it drops down, it goes to the right ventricle. Here is where we have a big pump. That's our first major pump. It starts what we call the pulmonary circuit. This goes to the lungs, both lungs. Um, here is where gas exchange takes place. So CO2 is dropped off in the lungs so we can breathe it out, and oxygen that we breathe in is now added to the blood. This moves because of simple diffusion, so no energy is required for this other than, of course, the energy to make your muscles work, your diaphragm to move your lungs. Um, once we now have oxygenated blood, we return back to the heart and we go to the left atrium, oh, left atrium, and then we go to the left ventricle. Here is where that second major pump is, and the ventricles, by the way, are really thick down here, so they have strong muscle tissue, and they can add, uh, add a really strong pump. This pump has to be the strongest in the body because it travels through your aorta and your, your arteries, and it goes to the rest of your body, where we drop off the oxygen, we pick up CO2, and we repeat the process, and we feed that deoxygenated blood back into the heart. Um, so there's really two main cycles here. There's two loops. Um, and that's basically how blood flows through the heart. Any questions there? No? Um, just a couple things about the lungs. Um, not really much to say other than, of course, lungs aren't hollow. They're filled with these things called alveoli. Um, so they're like bundles of grapes. Remember, um, it's not just like an empty balloon inside of your lung. It's literally like little bundles of grapes that allows this gas exchange to take place. More surface area, more stuff we can do. And then just a defined gas exchange for you. movement of oxygen and CO2 into cells. That's a big deal. We want to make sure we understand what that is. Um, to define our simple blood structures, we have arteries. What direction do they flow? Away. They flow away from the heart. I'm going to just draw a heart. Look at me. Oh. You with me? Um, Veins, they move toward the heart, always. Oh, um, we have capillaries. I have no heart or you have no heart? I know. Um, capillaries, um, these basically are the smallest blood vessels. And that's where gas exchange happens at the cellular level, because only a few red blood cells can fit through there at a time, maybe even only single file. Um, I should also mention um, arteries are where that plaque would build up that leads to like heart problems, you know what I mean? So if you eat a poor diet and there's a lot of fats or lipids, cholesterol that are in your diet, they're going to get into your, your blood system, and once they're there, they're going to stay within your arteries, which of course is going to add more constriction. Arteries have the highest pressure in the body, so um, that's not good. If they already have high pressure and then you restrict their blood flow, that's even more pressure, which can lead to like hypertension or high blood pressure and in turn lead to maybe things like blood clots forming in the heart, which is a heart attack, or in the brain, which is a stroke, or heart disease, which is basically the deterioration of that heart tissue overall. You guys doing okay? Yeah? Eat healthy. That's the main concept from it. Okay. Um, let's talk about that immune system. Um, this could be crazy, crazy, crazy complex. Like, literally, doctors study this for, like, their jobs. Um, and uh, we're just going to squeeze it into, like, one little corner of a page. But let's define what a pathogen is. It's a disease-causing agent. 
Um, I gave you all the examples down there. There's bacteria, there's fungi. Um, of course, there are viruses and there's parasites. I just want to make a note here. A virus is not alive. They are not alive. They're not a living thing. Um, they're basically DNA or RNA trapped in a protein coat, which basically take over your cells, and that's how they reproduce. So we basically have lines of defense. The first line of defense in your body, it says physical barriers. Does anybody know what a physical barrier would be for your body? Yeah? Skin is a good one. Anything else? Mucous membranes. Yes, yeah, skin and mucous membranes. Those are physical barriers that stop things from getting inside of you. That's the main concept. The second line of defense is basically development of a fever and inflammation. Um, inflammation is basically swelling. This makes more space for certain types of cells to move into an area um, and identify, hopefully, the pathogen that's in there. Um, fever um, basically releases... Um, interferons which basically protect healthy cells I know that seems crazy but if we increase our temperature it makes it harder for let's say a virus to infect our already healthy cells um, there are still some bad cells in there which we're gonna have to take care of otherwise and then we have our third line of defense this is the one we always get mad at. This is the one that causes us the most inconvenience because this takes the longest time to respond. We have specialized cells that are called T and B cells. Um, they basically attack the pathogen. And we are really oversimplifying that. Um, there's even like things like natural killer cells which do something similar. Um, and then there's antibodies. Um, antibodies basically um, stick to the pathogen. Um, so they help identify it and hopefully clump it together to make it easier to fight. And then our last thing there are called memory cells. They remember infection for future events. Now, this is what we call immunity. So um, that's actually up here. Um, immunity happens in two capacities. We have innate, which basically means you're born with it. So you don't have to worry about getting sick of anything that, that you're already immune for um, because your body is like, yeah, I got it. I got it from mom. I got it from dad. Um, it's really mom, but whatever. Acquired. Um, acquired is going to be you experience it. and body remembers. So you have to have a run-in with it in some case. Sometimes we force acquired immunity by giving people vaccinations, which basically isn't supposed to make you sick, but it's supposed to make your body say, hey, I know how to fight this off, so if the real thing shows up, your body can. Yes, sir? Uh, can you like, find out what you're immune to when it's like, innate? Or do you just like, find out? Um, I mean, I guess you kind of will because you won't have like what were considered common pathogens in the past. Um, no, I mean, we have a kind of general understanding of some things that we're kind of immune to already, but no, um, we, we don't know once we're born. Kind of makes it scary or fun, however you want to view it. Um, and then we have di different forms of defense, right? Um, basically, we have things like antibiotics, um, which basically means it kills bacteria. We can grow these in like a pill form, and that helps us out. And then, of course, there is hygiene. Keep things clean. Take a bath. Do your laundry. You know, cook your food. Those things. Those keep us nice and alive. We like that. Increase in quality of life. Any questions there? Antibiotic resistance is a growing concern. Try to keep in mind. Um, antibiotics will... Uh, run out if we continue using them the way we have been. So when you're given a prescription, 
Use all of it as directed. Do not stop using it. Please, please, please. I will appreciate it later, especially when I'm an old person. And you will, too. Because we might still have some antibiotics left over. Can I move on? Last box of the review. We're okay. We do. So, reproductive organs. Well, with the male organs, of course, there's testes. Um, this is the important thing because this is the main sex organ, right? And these produce sperm, which are the sex cells. Those are really the only things that we care about for male anatomy. Sorry, guys. That's it. That there's nothing special to you. The main goal is sperm, and testes make the sperm. Um, the female organs, though, a whole lot more complex and um, are, are arguably uh, more important. So, um, of course, the vagina is basically going to protect um, the developing child or the fetus. Um, and also, that's basically because it's slightly acidic. Um, it can kill bacteria that could get in there. The ovary, well, that's the uh, sex organ, primary sexual organ. Um, then we have the ova or ovum. These are the eggs. Simply stated, these are the sex cells. Uh, and then we have the fallopian tube. Hey, this is where fertilization occurs. The battleground to make you is in the fallopian tube. And of course, the uterus is where it develops. Um, I've listed all the organ, uh, I'm sorry, all the hormones that are important for development. That's either to reach sexual maturity or to maintain a pregnancy. Kind of all of these are involved in some way. But when it comes to fertilization, well, you have a few names and you should know. Um, first off, you are a zygote. Then you become a blastocyst because you're a real blast when you're younger. Um, then you become an embryo. And then you become a fetus. And after that, you are babby. Babbies. Um, so a lot of things happen during this. Um, we have trimester one. What happens? Well, um, we start to see um, tissue specialize. Um, we start to see um, arms and legs, even a head and body. Um, we start to see growth, of course. Um, yeah. You're basically not very much, but hey, you're starting to specialize. You're starting to look less like an alien. Um, with trimester two, um, with trimester two, I'm just trying to make sure I got the room. Um, we start to see the mass increases. We start to see muscles develop. Start to see the brain develop. We even start to see movement. And I should go ahead and mention fingers and toes. They start to be really clear. So the finer details are starting to come in. Um, most babies that are born just after the beginning of trimester three, they got a 95% of survival. Seven months in, it's almost a go. Um, but in trimester three, we start to see cool stuff like hair, or I'm sorry, I, I don't know what I'm trying to write here, hair and nails. We start to see dreaming. I don't know what they're dreaming of, but they're dreaming. Their eyes are moving while they sleep. They go through a sleep cycle. Their eyes are moving around as they dream. Yeah. Um, they lengthen. And of course, before they're born, they turn down, or at least they're supposed to. Um, so they're able to make like a head first exit through the vaginal canal. So. Do you guys have any questions on reproduction? Okay.